everybody. It's so great to be here with you again. I just want to start by saying thank you to all the wonderful messages that I received from so many of you from the synopsis. I'm, I'm so touched that what um, I had contributed helped so many of you and just continue to be positive and lead with compassion. And hopefully in time, things will get better. I wanna to talk to you today about another topic that is very difficult. The holiday season is coming upon us. And you know, the holiday season is not very um, happy for people that are not alienated from their children. Holidays are difficult for many, many families um, around the country. Even holiday dinners, as you know, are not always um, the best. People come with uh, conflicts that aren't resolved and sitting around the dinner table can be very difficult. But it's a whole different ball game when we are talking about um, not being with your alienated children, your loved ones during this time. Holidays represent um, a time of togetherness of family. And when you're not together with your family, it's very difficult on you emotionally. So I wanna to talk to you today about some things that you can do over the holidays that are helpful and have been helpful to parents um, and grandparents who are alienated from their children or grandchildren. The most important advice that I can give you today is self-care. Self-care during the holidays is extremely important to get through it. And that oftentimes means when you are having a moment where you are missing your children or your grandchildren, or a panic is coming over you, that you take a moment to sit down with yourself and comfort yourself during those periods and hug yourself even, or put your hands over your heart and say to yourself that I am upset that I am not with my children or my grandchildren. Own it to yourself. Don't run from it. When we run from things, they continue to perpetuate over time. But if we sit with them and we take care of ourselves, they tend not to, um, be a part of our lives um, in a ruminating way as much as they would be if we run from them. And say to yourself that even though I'm not with my children or grandchildren this holiday, there is always hope that I may be in the future. This, this concept of hope really changes the way that you look at um, your life and the way that you live it on a daily basis. And, and just the feeling of having some hope with inside of you that things can change, often change the way that your brain processes um, information and the way that you can move through your life on a daily basis. And there is always hope. Self-care also includes doing nice things for yourself, taking a walk, taking a bath, having a cup of coffee, calling a friend, these are all things that are really helpful during the holiday season. Another thing that is very helpful is keeping yourself busy. To keep your mind off of you know, what could be being stuck in memories. We'll talk about memories in a minute. Being stuck in a place where you cannot get your mind beyond the past where things happen. So keeping yourself busy is a great way to just get through the holiday season in that period of time. Another great thing to do is to give to others during this holiday season. And you might say to yourself, but Dr. Sue, no one's giving to me right now. But when we give to others or we work at a soup kitchen or we um, help out at an event with other um, people, it gives us a good sense that we are capable of still giving to others. And when we give to others and we receive positivity back from them from doing it, it makes us 
ourselves feel much better about ourselves. So I think that's another great thing to do is help out where you can um, be a part of festivities that are going on. There's tons of activities probably in your hometown or wherever you are where you can um, be a part of things and feel a part of a community. And that is very important when you're not feeling a part of what is of what you would normally do if your children were in your lives. Now, I wanna switch a little bit right now to uh, parents who are uh, divorced and who struggle with the holidays because that is something that really does come up and um, creates a lot of conflict during this time. So I want to remind you that the most important thing about the holiday season is that your children are not in the middle of what is going on between you and your ex. So it's important to be compromising during this time, meaning the child needs to feel that they are not being used as um, a ping pong ball or playing tug of war, that they are able to spend some time with um, one parent and then spend time with the other parent. And even if your uh, parenting um, plans say that one parent is supposed to have the children for, for this holiday and you're supposed to have them for another holiday, it's often a nice thing to do to try to have some compromise and you know maybe split the day in some way if that's possible or another thing that works really well is it's not the holiday specifically that is so meaningful it's what is most meaningful is that you have some time with your children so if you want to do thanksgiving um on uh, the night before thanksgiving and you can work that out with your ex and have your children for that night, then, then I would go for that because it's not the holiday that matters. It's the time that you can spend with your children if you're able to do that. So I would take advantage of all of those things um, if it is possible. What you do not want to do is is create more drama or chaos or arguments with the person that is already adversarial. So if they say, no, you cannot see Johnny on um, Thanksgiving, that's my day. I would say, uh, I would say to your ex, okay, I understand you can have them on this day and um, I will celebrate with them when I see them. They, that is a better way because if you go into the arguing, it will cause drama and ultimately it ends up hurting your child. So that's advice on that. If you are um, in a place where you are uh, not having any contact at all and there is no room for contact, I still suggest that you send something to your children um, or your grandchildren, even if it's a text message, if it's on Instagram, wherever it is, just saying happy holidays and I'm thinking of you. If you don't get a response, it doesn't matter. It is the effort of putting it out into the world and knowing that you are doing the right thing in doing that. It will also give you hopefully some sort of feeling that you are continuing to do the right thing. And when we do the right thing in a consistent way over time, it does two things for us. One, it helps us to feel good inside about what we're doing. And two, it allows your children or grandchildren to know that you're still thinking of them, you still love them, and that you're still there for them. And over time of doing that in a very consistent way, 
often um, does lead to something later on in time. I can't tell you when, but it opens up hope that things can get better. And so you have control over that. That's something that you can make a choice about to send a, a nice message or you don't have to say anything. Here's something that I do not suggest. Uh, I do not suggest, you know, going and sitting with all of the memories of what ha of all the holidays that you had with your children during these holiday seasons, because what it does is it creates rumination and it'll, it perpetuates the sadness within you. But please do not get me wrong. I am all for you holding on to your memories. Memories are something that no one can take from you. And I wanna be clear on that. So hold some time for yourself to remember those good memories and those times and those holidays that you did have with your children and grandchildren, but do not sit all day long reminiscing about that or going through pictures because what it will do is it will trigger, hear me, trigger that sadness and that rumination and that is not the place you want to be. And you want to be in a positive place if you can be. I know this is extremely difficult to remember some of those good times, bring them up in your mind, and then let them go. And um, another thing that I think is positive to do is try to surround yourself with people that you feel good about being with during the holidays. If you're alone and you don't have anyone to spend the holidays with, I do suggest that you find a place in your community where you can go so you are around people that you can be with. Do something for yourself during that holiday time so that you can set up a plan for yourself so you do not have to be alone. But I do also know that sometimes that is not possible. So what I really suggest, and this has worked for a lot of people that are unfortunately alone, is that you go out and you get yourself um, a magnificent dinner or you cook your favorite things and you eat them with yourself, watching television, you know, and, and just being with yourself and praising yourself for how you have gotten through the holidays, this holiday season and, and wants to come and give yourself that compassion of how strong you are to be able to get through these very difficult times. I, I think that all of you are so, so very strong and brave to manage these difficult times, especially during the holidays, because the holidays do represent family. But whether you're not talking to your loved ones or you're having brief interactions with them, they are still your family and will always be your family. I know a lot of people during this time do a lot of reflection also about moving on into um, the future with, their children or grandchildren, you can also do that as well. Even take out a, a, a notebook or a journal and start writing to them, writing your feelings out. Any way that you can find to comfort yourself during the holiday season is what I suggest to you. We don't wanna heighten conflict during the holiday season. We want to decrease it. And we do that by working within ourselves and controlling what we can control. And the three things that we can control during the holiday season is taking care of ourselves, making a decision or a choice. If we want to send a card or an email or a text or even a, a um, food or a gift, to our loved ones, that's a choice that you have that you can make on your own. 
And the third choice is not to um, participate in conflict if it does arise. Everybody's emotions during holiday seasons are heightened, um, but especially during uh, a time when you are alienated from your children or grandchildren. So that is my advice for you this holiday season. What I'm wishing all of you is hope and new beginnings for this upcoming year. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me at www.drsueandyou.com. Don't ever give up hope and take care of yourself first, because if you can't take care of yourself, you're not in a position to really be able to take care of others. Thank you so much. So, uh... Good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's my pleasure as always to be speaking with you, in particular this time of the year as the holidays approach us and issues pertaining to uh, mental health, uh, peace of the mind, and coping uh, come to the forefront uh, as they often do each year. Um, I'd like to uh, hopefully tell you some short lessons that I have learned from what I call uh, high highly contested or contested living in the courtroom. I'm in the trenches constantly with clients in the courtroom fighting very difficult battles in involving parental alienation and other issues. And um, I have observed that I think a number of the lessons that I've learned and observed from uh, being in the courtroom and being in the trenches so often and so frequently can be applied to each of you who are struggling on some level uh, to uh, cope with the holidays and uh, the inability to have a harmonious, peaceful relationship with your children or grandchildren. Um, and let me try to give you maybe six or seven uh, lessons in this very brief period of time that uh, hopefully will help you uh, in this regard. Uh, the first thing that I would uh, say is look at the big picture. And what I mean by that, uh, when we're in trial, um, I tell my clients to keep focused on the big picture. What are we trying to accomplish at the end of the day? Almost like a, a baseball game that has innings where one inning the team may be up and the next inning the team may be down. Trials are like that where uh, a given testimony of a witness or certain evidence that's admitted can often turn uh, the course of a trial and take it in a, in a much more positive direction. And I would say that with respect to uh, approaching these holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, Hanukkah, and others, um, look at the big picture. And by that, I mean, while we don't want to diminish the real feelings of pain and loss that you have and are suffering, and you should certainly pay attention to those, recognize that this holiday season is one of many. And hopefully in looking back, there have been um, many uh, happy, productive, holidays, uh, good times with your children and grandchildren, and certainly looking forward, um, place yourself in a mindset envisioning good times, happy times, happy holidays in the future. And if you were to look at this holiday season as one of uh, dozens uh, that have happened and will happen, um, perhaps it gives you a little more perspective that while this particular holiday season may not be all that you dream and hope, um, it has its place in the continuum of getting you to the place where you want to be, and maybe it puts a little bit less emphasis on it uh, as being um, the entirety of your focus. Um, the second thing I would, I would say is, and I say this to my clients, uh, that it's important to breathe, and uh, not only breathe, but just to adopt the appropriate mental state going through the holidays, just as you have to going through stressful litigation. Um, we've got mental health professionals that are probably giving you much better advice regarding uh, mental uh, state and coping strategies uh, to help you in that regard. But I tell my clients when they're on the witness stand to breathe, they forget to breathe, they tighten up, um, they um, seize up, uh, the moment becomes overwhelming. Breathing is a wonderful tool slowly in through the nose and out through the mouth to calm yourself. And it's important as you approach these holidays to breathe, literally. Find a few minutes to peacefully 
breathe through your nose and out through your mouth. Uh, take a walk, relax, exercise. Um, try to calm yourself because you don't do yourself or anyone else, including the loved ones, the children and grandchildren that you're fighting for, if you are maintaining a stressed attitude throughout all of this. I, I tell clients in trial that the whole process of developing a parental alienation case and trying it and all the aftermath of it is more like a marathon than a sprint. It's not a hundred yard dash and the race is over in nine or 10 seconds. Uh, it's a 26 mile marathon that's got many components to it uh, and is arduous and difficult. And you can't possibly get through a marathon without breathing. You can't poss possibly approach the holidays in my mind in an appropriate state of mind if you are not intentionally taking some time to calm yourself, to breathe, to relax, and to keep everything in perspective, I think that will help you. Um, also, I'd like to mention the concept of process. Um, lessons learned from trying difficult cases, um, the process that's involved and the process that's involved um, you know, with the holidays and coping with the holidays. So with respect to the process of litigation, as I just mentioned, it's a marathon. There are pretrial phases, there's discovery, there's depositions, there's preparing for trial, there's opening statements, there's direct and cross-examination, there are closing arguments, there are post-trial briefs. It's a process. Um, you cannot leap over any one of those um, steps, if you will, in contested litigation and get to your objective, each step you have to proceed through and you need to proceed through as best as you can. The holidays are the same. Um, maybe another quick analogy would be um, a vacation. So I think a vacation has three different components. Um, the planning phase, which has its own joys of choosing between locations, accommodations, activities, um, et cetera. The actual vacation itself, where the time is spent enjoying what has been planned. And then the third phase are the memories that last afterwards um, regarding the good time shared, the places visited, the experiences um, enjoyed by all. I think that can be applied both the process of trial, um, the stages of a vacation, and the holiday itself. There, there are really three components to the holiday, this particular holiday, be it Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, et cetera, uh, that I think are equally important. Uh, one phase is all of the activities leading up to the holiday. Um, there's so many things beautiful and wonderful, uh, peaceful around you um, in the process of leading up to the holidays, whether it's uh, seeing a particular uh, performance or holiday performance, whether it's shopping, uh, you know, and enjoying the sights and sounds and smells of that activity, whether it's um, if you live in a place that has snow, enjoying the winter wonderland aspect of it. There's the holiday itself, um, which I think can be enhanced by again, remembering past holidays and relishing them, almost sipping them as you are enjoying a nice glass of wine or a cup of coffee in the morning and just really savor those wonderful past experiences. And then looking back after the holiday season and really focusing on what was good. I know that there's plenty that's not good when you're not with your children and your grandchildren and I'm not diminishing any of that, but maybe the holiday is enhanced more because you spent the holiday with other relatives and other friends. Maybe you devoted some time in a charitable manner to help those even more misfortunate and suffering. Um, there's so much need in our country at this time for uh, graciousness, help, charity. Um, and there's a lot of ways to fill the holiday if you look at it as a process, both leading up to the holiday itself and then your memories of how uh, and what happened during the holiday season. I hope that that may help you some cope with the stress of being without loved ones, children and grandchildren uh, during the holidays. Um, I tell clients as we approach trial that oftentimes the fear of the event 
uh, is worse than the event itself. And clients almost universally tell me, well, that was not pleasant testifying, but it certainly wasn't as bad as I had envisioned. We all have inner voices, um, mental talk, if you will, uh, images um, of how things will be. We can often and do often catastrophize that of all the many options that could happen at trial, we focus on the catastrophic one, which is the worst case scenario. Um, and certainly on, at times the worst case scenario does occur, but more times than not, the experience itself of being in trial, being in a stressful situation, cross-examined by an aggressive lawyer is not really as, as bad um, having gone through it as all of your fears and anxieties leading up to it. So with respect to the holidays, um, just as I tell clients to imagine yourself in trial, sitting on a witness stand, being asked questions, think of the worst questions that concern you the most being asked. And of course, I work with clients on these issues. And let's address them and let's get them out in the open and let's talk about them so that when it actually happens, um, it is far less painful and less stressful. With respect to the holidays, incorporate the mental images from the past, the good times with your children and grandchildren at holiday times. And again, savor them like I mentioned earlier. Um, but then go a step further and before the holidays are upon us or upon you, um, imagine life at Christmas, life at Hanukkah, life at um, Thanksgiving, where there's an empty seat and your child or grandchild is not present. Allow yourself to grieve over that. Um, allow yourself to feel the sadness uh, of not having that God-given right uh, to be with your children and your grandchildren, <clears throat> excuse me, at such an important time. I don't know whether that will bring peace uh, when the holiday itself is there and you've already sort of mentally imagined it and you've sort of processed it and you have uh, worked your way through it a little bit better. Um, I'm hopeful that that also will be of assistance uh, to you to have proper mental images, imagine what it's gonna be like, allow yourself to grieve and feel it, and then um, jump into the joy of the holiday season as best you can with others that are meaningful and important to you and can help you uh, enjoy the spirit of the holiday season. Uh, practice, I've mentioned on many of these talks uh, over the last couple of years, practice is key, practice and preparation is key in trial um, to obtaining good results. You can't just walk into the courtroom, the lawyer or the client, sit on the witness stand and say, let's go. Uh, there's months and months of uh, preparation and careful planning and being able to think of moves and counter moves. Um, you can't always foresee everything that's gonna happen in the trial, but if you are prepared with your witnesses, with your documents, uh, with arguments that may be thrown at you, curveballs, unexpected items, uh, you're gonna have likely a better result because you have thought through all of the different options uh, that could happen in a stressful trial. So um, with respect to, and this is somewhat similar to what I was mentioning before about mental images, but practice uh, walking through in your mind, however the holiday will unfold, whether it's at a relative's home or a friend's home or at your own home, and going through the steps of that event, relying upon past events, uh, and projecting how you think it might go. Um, and steal yourself, prepare yourself for the ups and downs that will come from this experience. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is by facing your worst fears, putting them out in the open, not only forming mental images, but talking to others, whether it's a th your therapist or your loved one, your spouse, uh, a relative, share your feelings um, and, and sort of walk through this event with them. Um, I think the event itself will be less painful and, and hopefully allow you to focus on other meaningful, special moments that will bring you joy um, during an otherwise difficult situation. Um, control, I've learned that clients uh, often want to control and try to control every step in the process of litigation 
And there's only so much that you can control um, as a client. Uh, you're on the witness stand, you're being asked questions, you can certainly control your answers, you can control your demeanor, but you can't control the judge's or the jury's reaction. You can't control what the other lawyer does. You can't control what the other witnesses say. And I think you will be better served in highly contested litigation involving parental alienation to try as best you can to let go of control. Um, with respect to the holidays, I think on some level you have to let go of control. And um, don't beat yourself up and blame yourself for the fact that your children or grandchildren are rejecting having a relationship or contact with you. Um, it's not your fault. You didn't cause this. And you can't control them, certainly in one holiday season, to change it. It's a very complex dynamic, as you've heard on many of these talks over the years. Um, but recognize that you're in a continuum, which had a start and will have a finish. And the hope is that the finish will be um, arriving you and your children and grandchildren at a much healthier, happier place. But it's a process and you have to go through the continuum and you cannot control every step of the way. So I think you may relieve some of the pressure and burden on yourself uh, by letting go of the control and know that while maybe this holiday may not work out the way I would like, uh, perhaps next holiday will be the turning point um, where I have my children back, where I can embrace them, where I can tell them I love them, and where we return to the good positive relationship that we had before. Um, while, while you can't control many, many things in your environment, you certainly can control some, and maybe even to a, a large degree, your perspective and your attitude. You know, it's the, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Um, focus on that. Try, try to view the glass, even in difficult uh, circumstances, as being half full as opposed to half empty. Um, I think this is particularly important with the first holiday that's coming upon us. Uh, which is thanksgiving is to give thanks and be thankful for all the good wonderful things that you do have in your life in other words if the focus is solely on um, the result at trial what the next witness is going to say um, you may be disappointed if the focus of, on the holiday is only i don't have my children i don't have my grandchildren you may be very disappointed but if you have a thankful mindset thankful attitude and there's so much to be thankful for, even in dark times. Um, thankful for the fact that you're alive. Thankful for your relationship um, you know, with our creator. Thankful for your friends. Thankful for your health. Thankful for uh, being able to get up in the morning and see the sun and enjoy another day. Uh, thankful for the little things, like in trial. Thankful for what you feared worse didn't happen. Thankful for a particular witness's uh, testimony that was amazingly supportive and helpful to the cause. Um, you know, thankful for the home you live in. Thankful for the neighbors um, and the friends that you have. Thankful for the job that you have. Uh, and, and it goes on and on. Um, I think you'll be amazed, uh, and you may even want to journal and want, make a list of all the things that you're thankful for. Um, I think while nothing replaces having your children or grandchildren in a healthy relationship with you for the holidays, um, I think if you just consider and focus on all of the things in your life to be thankful for, you will feel uh, more complete, you will feel richer, you will feel, feel more full, you will feel loved, you will feel part of something greater and even above um, your life and what you're doing. And I think all these things can bring you comfort uh, during the holidays. So focus on the things in your life that you can be thankful for, that you are thankful for. And I hope they bring a smile to your face uh, during these difficult times, that there's a lot of good in your life, uh, even though you're struggling mightily um, in this area of parental alienation and having no contact or relationship with your kids. Um, I would say, uh, in closing, uh, during these short remarks, is maintain the proper perspective. Um, this is not the first holiday season to be shared with the children or grandchildren. It's not the last. 
None of us have a crystal ball. Um, things may look dark and bleak uh, in the case, in the relationship. Um, the judge, the amicus attorney, ad litem attorney, psychologist, opposing counsel, uh, the world may seem against you, but I have seen cases that look impossible uh, in the courtroom uh, to turn the corner and they do turn the corner and good results come. I've had countless people tell me you can never win that case, it's impossible. You might as well give up and settle at this point. And uh, I pursue and persevere because that's what my clients are entitled to and I wanna advocate for them strongly. Have the perspective that good things can happen in the courtroom and good things can and will happen with this uh, very tortured relationship and situation that's caused by the alienating parent or grandparent. And again, know that this is a place in time. This is not the ultimate destination this holiday season. Um, you know, I've heard before and may have shared before with you um, a psalm or a proverb to the effect that uh, life is a journey, not a destination. And you are on a journey in recovering your relationship with your children and grandchildren. Um, and this particular holiday season is not the final destination where the train stops and the journey is over. Uh, it's part of a continuum. Try to keep that in perspective. Uh, I hope uh, to each of you that are listening that these words uh, have provided you or can provide you some comfort and some tools to help you cope better with the holidays. I wish each of you a very healthy, happy holiday season and uh, wish nothing more than to see a prompt reunification between you and your children and grandchildren so that they can have the love and joy of your love and joy um, spread over them, not only during this holiday season, but during the rest of their life. Uh, thank you very much for your time and happy holidays to each of you. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Eddy. And I want to wish you well for the holidays, understanding the situations that so many people are facing. So I want to give you several tips. The first one is to think positive that you'll be reconciling someday with your loved one who's become alienated. And with that in mind, I can't guarantee it, but of the cases that I've seen, um, many have reconciled, even if it's several years later. And so it helps to have good holidays so that you can tell people, tell them about what you did. Um, take some pictures, write in a journal, say how it went. You want to be able to have good times that you can share, good memories you can share, uh, and say who you saw. You know, so-and-so says hi all of that so that you have a record of good times that you can share and discuss. The second thing I wanna say is sending a holiday card. Now, it's, you may not have a response. In fact, there's a good chance you won't. But two things about this. One is the research seems to show that many adult children eventually make contact and reconcile and wonder why they didn't hear anything. You know, why didn't you reach out? Why didn't you try to let me know how much you love me and that you were trying to contact me? So with the understanding that when it arrives now, they may tear it up. They may just, um, uh, it may not even reach them. Uh, the person they're living with may destroy things like that or hide things like that. So make a copy of your holiday card and the message that you include. In terms of messages, just have light messages, you know, thinking of you and here's what we're doing and things that, that you would want to share with the idea maybe it'll get through even though there's a good chance that it won't. But if you have a copy, then later on, maybe even a few years later, you can share that and show, see, here's when I sent about this holiday season. And here was what I said to you then. So you make the effort and it reassures them when they do come around 
that you never stop trying. Now, don't make it heavy. So don't say this is a time to say how upsetting it is that you're not seeing them. Because in many ways, you want to take the role of the adult, of the grown-up. And children really need more than one parent. They really need two parents. They need their grandparents. I, I'm one that really believes it takes a village to raise a child and that it's too bad that children become so isolated that there's the, uh, the technological ability to do that, that people become so isolated and that there's some people that want to isolate a child. So being positive. So this, both of these tips, um, having a good holiday, making a record of it, and also sending a holiday card. And of course, I regularly tell clients to send something maybe every couple months, a note saying, here's something I recently learned. I thought you might be interested in this. And just a tip, because that's what children do learn from their parents. They learn how to live life from many different points of view. The third point I want to make is really avoid blame so that whatever you're communicating doesn't communicate anger or blame at the child who may not be in touch. So keep that out of any letters, cards, et cetera. And sometimes it helps to show it to somebody else just to make sure. One of the methods I developed for communicating in high conflict situations is called the BIF method, brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And I actually have some books that I think are, are on the website about this method for co-parent communication, if there's a chance to communicate, is keeping it brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And so that's part of that is have somebody else review what you've written, a friend, family member, someone that you feel comfortable with. A uh, fourth point I'd like to make is allow yourself to have a good time. Um, you don't have to be isolated, lonely, et cetera, because you're mourning the loss of a family member's contact. That what you wanna do is have a good time, feel good for yourself, nurture yourself. Um, some of the most important things that are said about our mental health is we need people who are nice to us around us. And so find those people and spend time with them. And a holiday time can be a fun time where you share baking cookies, making decorations, doing things with people that help you feel good. Even though it's sad that you're not able to include an alienated child, is that you're giving yourself energy, which will help you be emotionally available when the time does come that they come back into your life. So allow yourself to have a good time. Then also allow yourself to be alone and quiet if you wish to be or part of the time. It's okay, you don't have to pretend that you're happy and and bubbly and all of that when you're not, um, but it's okay if you are. So both sides of this, allow yourself to have a good time, but allow yourself to be alone and quiet. Now, if you have difficult people to deal with over the holidays, that's one area I focus on a lot, is ways to manage that. So if you think a situation is going to be difficult, it's okay to avoid that situation as long as you don't become totally isolated. And if you're around difficult people, don't feel like you have to share what's going on in your life unless you want to. And don't feel like you have to convince them of anything. That's one thing we find with high conflict people is they have rigid opinions about things and they're easy to get into arguments with because you're trying to convince them of another point of view and that just doesn't happen for high conflict people. So whether it's about food or about 
alienation or whether it's about politics is don't feel like you're going to, you know, change anybody's mind. So you don't have to engage in those types of conversations. Um, and my seventh point is that if you host an event, you might want to help keep things positive and cheerful and not negative. Um, if you think some people are going to be bringing negativity with them, you might even post a little sign that says something like, tis the holiday season. Let's avoid hot topics that divide us and focus on discussions we can all enjoy. Thanks for making this a pleasant time for all. So if you post a little sign like that um, on a wall somewhere or on a table, something, you can then point to that. If people start getting into a conflict or an argument and it's starting to become unpleasant because the holidays you really want to have be a pleasant time, pleasant time for people to be together. And you don't want anything that could be uh, used against you and say, see, you were difficult or you were unpleasant or something like that. And these are things that people say and sometimes even children say when there's no basis for that. Um, it's an exaggeration. But this may be things that will help you um, manage the situation and hopefully help you have an okay holiday season. So again, I'll just briefly go over these points. One is, the first one is think positive. Someday you'll be reconciling and you want to have good memories of the holidays to show and tell to your loved one who's been alienated. So take some pictures, write in a journal. And these are general principles as well over the course of a year. Second is send a holiday card with a short note that's cheerful and formative, but not um, heavy, not getting too deep into things. The third is in general is don't blame the alienated child for their behavior. And what's, what's helpful to note is that emotions are contagious. And a lot of times they've absorbed the emotions of someone else in their life. And they've absorbed the thinking of someone else in their life. And that this isn't necessarily the way they're going to think uh, when they're more independent, um, when they've had a chance to see more of the world. And so they're going to have a bigger point of view. Uh, so don't get angry at them. Don't blame them. Again, allow yourself to have a good time. And it's OK. You don't have to feel guilty for having a good time. Find people you can enjoy and be friends with. Distract yourself. You can get energy from unrelated things. Um, also, I think going for walks. Uh, being out where it's green. They say that our brains need a lot of green. And so go where there's trees and grass and, and, and enjoy yourself. Um, and enjoy yourself in the snow. Um, if you're getting snow, I'm in San Diego, so I have to go to the snow. Um, but snow can have a holiday feeling to it. Also allow yourself to be uh, alone and quiet if you wish. Um, you don't have to be outgoing. And many people are more introverted, some are more extroverted, and it's okay to be yourself. There's value in all of us. Um, the sixth point again is that there's difficult people. You can avoid situations that are uncomfortable. You're allowed to do that. Um, or be, if you're in a conversation with someone and it starts to get uncomfortable, um, you can tell them, you know, I want to go uh, talk to so-and-so now, or just know you don't have to try to convince anybody of anything. And if you're around a table and someone's starting to say uncomfortable things, you can say, 
you know, that's, that's enough, Joe. And can you pass the carrots? <laughs> you know, something like that. Just very brief ways to set limits with people that are making you uncomfortable. And the last is if you host an event, is tell people we want this to be positive and maybe even post a sign that says, let's avoid hot topics so that we can all enjoy a good time and be positive. So the holidays can be a time of celebration, even if not everyone is there this year. So I wish you all the best, hang in there and know that you can do okay and take care of yourself during the holidays. Good evening, everyone. I am so grateful for this opportunity to share with you today. It is always an honor to be here. I'd like to thank Elaine, who works so diligently and is so faithful to the cause. She demonstrates a true devotion and commitment beyond what most people who volunteer would. So thank you, Elaine. I also want to thank Family Access and Elaine for making these monthly trainings available at no charge. So please share the Family Access website with other parents, grandparents, as well as any mental health and legal professionals that you know. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't already signed up for Dr. Harmon's training, Parental Alienation, Behavior, and Course of Control, the one and the same, that'll be on Sunday, November 21st from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Go ahead and do that now. And if you already have signed up for it, I want you to share this information with others who will enjoy this training and especially those legal and mental health professionals that you know. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about creating a legacy of love through developing a new tradition that can span the gap of alienation. You know, soon the holiday festivals will be upon us and we'll be in full swing, but there'll be something missing, right? The place setting for your son or daughter or grandchild. And you know, that melancholy nature of this fact only increases as the holidays approach and family gatherings are inevitable. But what if these moments could be turned into opportunities for hope instead of disheartenment? So I want you to stay with me because my train of thought is going somewhere that might not be intuitive. Did you know that more than 26 million people have had their DNA analyzed? to determine their genetic genealogy. And that this business model is estimated to be a $4 billion a year industry. Did you also know that the company Ancestry.com is just one of several genealogy sites and it has 15 million subscribers. And it is estimated to generate three billion dollars a year in subscriptions. This is a billion dollar genealogy industry and it is growing by leaps and bounds. But you, have you ever wondered why? It is because connecting to one's heritage, one's tribe, one's ancestry is a fundamental human longing. This quest of the mind is such a natural state of nurturing one's self-awareness that the study of one's genealogy becomes a fundamental part of our effort to develop self-knowledge as we reconnect our storylines to those that have gone before us. So what does this have to do with transforming moments of despair into hope? Well, you can use these times of family coming together and connecting to connect the present and the past with the future. See, although your son or daughter or grandchild may not be with you right now, we should never give up hope. Therefore, with those moments when all the family is together for a celebration, Let's not think of these moments of lost. 
but rather let's reframe them as a time to strengthen family bonds among those who are there in the present, while at the same time building a legacy for your alienated child or grandchild. Being a child of divorce and a divorcee myself, there are two treasures that helped build a legacy within my own family. First, there were the stories from my grandmother. Now, back in the day when I was a teenager, I wasn't quite smart enough to know or have the foresight that she actually wasn't gonna live forever and that I probably should have written all those things down. But nevertheless, I do remember that those were some of the best times of my life. Those times where I would sit with my grandmother and discover the youth of the woman that sat in front of me. See, during my own parents' divorce, things were so bad that I was sent to go live with my maternal grandmother from whom my own mother was estranged. And also whom up until that point in time, I had only ever seen her for a few weeks, once a year, because she lived 2,000 miles away. And while initially it was not ideal, what made that time so treasured and which really instilled in me a sense of belonging to a family that I had never actually belonged to was a time I got to spend talking with my grandmother about her life and the family that I had either never met because they passed away or because they live in another state. I remember my grandmother and I, we would talk about what life was like when, because she was born in 1908, I would ask her stories about how she fell in love with my grandfather and my step-grandfather, who her parents were, what my great aunts and uncles were like now and when they were little, and what she had hoped life would be like when she was little and what it actually became. It was during these talks that I came to understand that I had a family who had always loved me and my mother. The second treasure is my own family's Christmas tree skirt. My husband and I um, made it with our children uh, after we got married. See, we were a blended family and we decided that we needed to start a tradition to build a sense of family within our blended family. So I made a tree skirt not the best sewer in the world, but it didn't matter. I divided it into six sections. So every Christmas for 12 years, six on the front and six on the back, my husband, myself, and my children would use fabric paint to make handprints in the skirt. And then we would paint the theme for the year. For instance, one year our family dog passed away. So we made a little picture of him with a little halo. And as the children grew up, we painted their high school graduation, their first car, um, they graduated from college. And to this day, it is something that my children remember and talk about. And it was something that we bonded together. These, this blended family, these two families coming together through our shared experience. So I wanna ask you, what treasures could you start to make for your family that will fill the empty chair at the family gathering that will become the treasure you leave for your child or grandchild? How about setting a place for your son or daughter or grandchild at the gathering? Now, I'm not talking about an actual place setting, I'm talking about designating or creating a special place at the gathering where you could put a journal or a scrapbook for family members to write the family's heritage. Now, this isn't a one and done book. Rather, it's a continuous love story, the story of the family that never forgot, never stopped hoping, and always loved. It is the missing child or grandchild's treasure that one day will be shared with them. And it is for all time's sake, a story 
of love and a family. Although you may want to write a message to your son or daughter or grandchild expressing how much you miss them, remember this isn't about focusing on the loss. This is about including them in the celebration and creating a legacy that sends the message, you have always been part of our family. You were never forgotten and you were always loved. Every year, family members could write a note or place a picture in, in the book, perhaps of something that they've done over the past year or, or their school photos. Or, or maybe you could have a theme for the journal every year. Maybe one year it's happiest day of your life in this year or best vacation ever or favorite holiday, Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's or Valentine's Day or, or even Halloween. Maybe you could have one year be, um, what do you find inspirational? Describe your perfect day. Did you become who you thought you were gonna be at the age of seven? Or what's the best advice you ever got? Or whatever it is, whatever the theme may be. The goal is to create something that will one day provide your loved one with a keepsake that makes them feel like they were there all along through every holiday, through those important times on Thanksgiving and Christmas when the family met together. For older family members that find it difficult to write, you know, perhaps you could have a re recording or a younger family member write a message for the older family member. And that would give the younger family member an opportunity to have that shared experience with that older family member too. And if you're crafty, well, and even if you're not, perhaps you could start a family Christmas tree story, like we did. So you don't have to sew it yourself, but you could go to a Hobby Lobby or any other hobby store and has a wide selection of beautiful tree skirts that can be easily divided either sewing or with paint or what about if you asked every family member to bring an old piece of clothing and then you could take a family photo or you could have them bring a photo and you could print the photo on the clothing and then you could make a quilt out of it remember it's not a one and done project but rather an ongoing project that tells a story over time. Could you imagine your child open the book and they see all the stories? Or you hand them this Christmas tree skirt that has handprints that got bigger every year? Or this beautiful family quilt? And they can watch their family members, the little ones, grow over the years and they could see their grandparents that may or may not have passed away by the time they uh, come back into your life. Staying connected between generations is important in the development of one's mental stability and therefore providing these practical ways to develop a richer understanding of your family's background during the holidays will help not only build a legacy for your alienated child or grandchild, but it's also a gift that gives back to you and your family that's currently there in their mental health. And it does this in three ways. First, it helps to strengthen the family bonds, not only between the family members participating in activities, but in the family members uh, with the alienated child or grandchild. This even includes the younger family members that have maybe never even met the alienated child or too young to remember the alienated child or grandchild. And second, the activities help to build resiliency in you and your family members. Because as they participate in the process of building this sense of identity, they are actually building stronger values regarding the importance of family. Third and finally, this process helps you to alleviate your mental health sorry, to elevate your mental health by providing a practical and creative way for you to reframe the circumstances from the grief over the loss of another holiday 
to a more positive focus as it provides you with the opportunity to nurture the child or grandchild even though they are not physically present. These activities which produce a special keepsake ultimately will be received by the alienated child or grandchild will help the child or grandchild to build within their own schema of their self, their family's heritage, which will provide the alienated child or grandchild with a more complete sense of identity when they come back. And it will let them know that they were always loved and never forgotten. So as you embark on this holiday season, I wanna encourage you to be creative. Have fun with thinking about ways to start new traditions that'll turn the feeling of loss into love and nurturing. I hope that some of you try out some of these ideas. And if you do, I would love to hear how some of these projects are going. And I do uh, pray that all of you will have a blessed holiday season. And I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. I want to talk to you about getting through Christmas this year without your precious grandchildren. I won't speak for you, but I'm guessing that the Christmas holidays will be anything but fun if you can't see your wonderful grandchildren this year. I know I remember. For me, it happened a long time ago, 15 years ago, in fact. My wife, Anne, and I had already shopped for our two dear little grandbabies. We'd bought our oldest granddaughter, who was two at the time, an incredible little dollhouse. It was actually a, a very fancy jewelry case with rooftops that opened to reveal spacious little storage spaces. And the sides of the house pulled out as drawers for holding bracelets and necklaces and colorful little earrings. We fell in love with it the minute we saw it. And we knew that little Ellie would be thrilled to open that present on Christmas day. My wife, Ann promptly wrapped that dollhouse and the other presents and set them on shelves in the closet where we could get to them instantly when the Christmas season arrived. We were ready, but it didn't happen. Our daughter-in-law and our son had for some reason decided not to let us see their children that Christmas. We were heartbroken. Our family was ripped apart and there wasn't a thing we could do about it. We were as helpless as you may be now. So on Christmas Eve, we had to improvise. There was a young couple a few blocks from us that we had come to know because we took long walks in their neighborhood. They were losing their home to the bank and were going to move away to a less expensive part of town a few miles away. They had three little children and we figured that those children wouldn't have much of a Christmas gift wise because the parents simply couldn't afford very much that year. So on Christmas Eve, after we knew the little children would be in bed, we drove to their house with the presents we had wrapped for our grandchildren and gave them to the parents to put under their tree for their children to find the next morning. The parents were very grateful. We heard that the children were overjoyed and I've always felt good about what we did. The thing is that miserable Christmas was the first of a long string of Christmases when we didn't get to see our grandchildren. My wife, Ann died in 2013 and never did get to see the children again. I'm still here in 2021 and I haven't seen them either. Now I understand there are four of them, ranging in age from 12 to 17. Some of you know our story, I'm sure. I'm just telling it again for those who don't. I want you to understand where I'm coming from and the remarks I'm going to make. I'm not just an interested counselor or psychiatrist. I, I'm speaking to you from several years of real and painful experience. I'd like to make some suggestions about what I think you can do to make your Christmas season without your grandchildren this year more bearable. I can't guarantee anything. How you get along will depend a lot on your own inner strength and creativity and maybe your determination. But as an old former pastor and an author, 
I honestly believe there's that some of the things I'm going to suggest will really help you to survive the Christmas blues and maybe even find a modicum of happiness and enjoyment during this lovely and important season of our year. We won't know till you try, will we? The first thing I'm going to suggest is that you count your blessings. Remember that old hymn you might have sung during your lifetime, count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings and see what God has done. I remember that from my childhood many years ago, count your blessings. That may sound a little preaching or maybe even a bit trite and facetious, but I mean it. Just stop and think about how many wonderful things you have in your life. Sure, you may not get to see your beautiful grandchildren, and that's very, very regrettable, but there's still a lot of good things in your life, blessings and advantages a lot of people may not have in their lives. First, there's your home. You have a roof over your head, a, a place to be and live your life with a bed to sleep in and a fridge filled with food and, and a heater to keep you warm in the winter. Not everybody has that, you know. We sometimes forget what a privilege it is to have it. Then there's money, enough, hopefully, to buy food and clothes and gas for the car and whatever else you may need from day to day. And there's family, other people around you who care about you, who give you hugs and smiles and kind words, who make you feel comfortable, who help you to feel fulfilled. And there are friends the people you feel closest to who let you be who you are, who are happy with you and encourage you when you're down and lift you up when you feel dispirited or alone. You see what I mean? Sure, we'll miss the grandkids, but they're not the only ones who are important in our day-to-day -day living. They're only a part of the equation. We tend to forget that and to magnify their absence into the worst thing imaginable. But it isn't. We're so blessed, most of us, with a wealth of people and things that expand our lives and make them whole and meaningful. So remember to consider your many blessings and thank God for them. If nothing else, this, this will reduce your anxieties about not seeing your grandchildren. Now, the second thing I'll suggest is this, that you say some prayers every day for your child and your child's spouse and their children, your grandchildren. I mean, really pray for them, not just automatic run-of-the-mill prayers that you say without really thinking about them, but earnest, thoughtful prayers in which you truly invoke God's blessings on them. My oldest granddaughter, I've learned, has lupus a strange systemic disease that gives her a lot of pain when she has an attack. And when it does, she goes to bed and curls up into a little ball for hours at a time. That's hard for a 17 year old. And I ask God to support her spirit and reduce the pain to what's more bearable for her. Fortunately, our prayers never have to be perfect. God doesn't expect them to be perfect. God will help to cover our defects if we only have a good heart and the best intentions when we pray them. The third thing I'm going to suggest also has to do with prayer, and that is to keep a prayer list of other people you know who are dealing with a similar problem and pray regularly for them and their families. Maybe you don't know any other people who share this problem with you. If you don't, you can ask for some names from Elaine Cobb or from Amanda at Alienated Grandparents Anonymous. They know a lot of folks who are suffering from family alienation. and They might be happy to share the, some of the names, their first names at least, and some of those situations with you. There's something about caring for others, even a lot of others, that helps to mitigate our anxiety our anxieties about our own situations. I remember somewhere reading about some of the poor Jewish people who were interned by the Nazis before and during World War II. 
and the awful suffering they had to endure. You, you remember that. One couple, an older couple from the city of Nuremberg, said it helped them each day to say their prayers for the other inmates and to ask God to ease the pain and suffering of others around them in prison. Just remembering that they weren't alone, that others were undergoing the same deprivations and horrors they were experiencing, and to pray for them in their extremity seemed to make their own suffering more endurable. So make a list. It doesn't have to be long or difficult. Maybe the names and situations of two or three couples you've met or heard about and whose names you've obtained from one of the sources I've mentioned and ask God each day to make their burdens more bearable and give them hope and a belief in the future. You might be surprised what this does to alleviate your own pain and suffering. Are you ready for number four? Here it is. It's something that helped me. Start writing letters to your grandchildren about your life and how you truly care for them. You don't send these letters, you just write them, put them in a box or something. Maybe someday you'll give these letters to them so they can know how much you cared during your years of separation from them. Maybe not. The important thing is to vent your feelings in this way. I'm a writer, so mine got published, three, three volumes of them. And I hope someday to get them to my grandkids, not now. Now, my son and his wife would probably intercept them and destroy them. But someday when the children get away from home, then I'll somehow see that they get copies, mainly so they'll know how much their grandmother and I cared about them during our long years of separation. I think that will be important to them. If you want to see copies of the letters I wrote, they're in three volumes called From Poppy with Love, Letters from a Grandfather to the Grandchildren He Isn't Allowed to See. And they're available. I think you can find them on Amazon.com. From Poppy with Love from Amazon.com. I'm not trying to sell books, but they might provide the kinds of models you need to get started writing to your own grandchildren. I tried not to criticize my son and his wife in these letters, but I did want my four grandkids to know how much I missed them and sharing my love while they were little. Now, I'll offer my last suggestion. I could make more, but we don't have time right now. This is a biggie. Here it is. See the miracle. See the miracle. Life is grand. Life is more than you and I can comprehend it. It overwhelms our senses. It's big and it's wonderful. Sometimes in our distress, we forget that. You know, if we get a splinter in our finger or step on a nail, that, that becomes the thing we focus on. Don't let that happen over your grandchildren and the fact that you can't see them. Yes, it would be wonderful to have them with you for Christmas. It, it would be wonderful to have ready access to them all the time. But if you don't, don't let that pain become the focal point of all your feelings and attention. Keep it in perspective. Life is big, and it is beautiful, and it is mysterious, and it is grander than any poet ever imagined. Step back from your concern about your grandchildren and see the miracle, the great overarching wonder of life itself and, and of your experiences throughout your life. Don't allow thoughts about those children, wonderful as they are, to become the be all and the end all of your existence. That isn't good. That, that isn't the way things ought to work. Lift your eyes to other things, to, to global problems, to social needs, to the wonder of all it is. Give thanks for being alive, for, for whatever health you enjoy, for other loved ones and friends and, and the glory of everything that is. See the miracle. Keep that phrase in mind as you enter the holidays this year. They are a miracle. The holidays are a miracle. They grew out of a miracle. They should be miraculous to us 
in spite of all the hurts and distractions of our local finite existence. Just remember that, see the miracle. Repeat it over and over this year. That phrase, that, that single phrase can change your life and you can have a Merry Christmas even. And God bless you. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here with you again. I just want to start by saying thank you to all the wonderful messages that I received from so many of you from the synopsis. I'm, I'm so touched.